Today, as we gather together for our Bible study, uh, we have the chance to especially dive into the issue of out-of-body experiences. Now, some of these incredible experiences that uh, people sometimes have, maybe, maybe you've had one, maybe you know somebody who's had one, maybe you've read a book or seen a TV show or a movie about it. And so we're going to take some time to dive into these experiences, and especially from the point of view of God's Word. What does the Bible have to say about this? And what does, how, how does God shape our understanding of these uh, paranormal, outside the normal experiences? So as we begin our time together in God's word, let's open with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you so much for this beautiful day. Lord, we thank you that this is another day that you have made. Lord, thank you for saving us. Thank you for forgiving us. And thank you for giving us your rock solid and trustworthy word. That no matter what, we can always go to your word for answers. And we can always go to your word to know what is the truth. So Lord, we pray that you guide our time together as we dive into your word together. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So for our Bible study today, uh, what you'll want to especially have is, of course, a Bible. Now, there isn't one just a section in Scripture that completely answers all of our questions about out-of-body experiences. So we're going to be jumping around Scripture quite a bit. So if you're on your phone or your tablet, we're going to be bouncing around the app quite a bit. If you've got a paper Bible in front of you, we're going to be flipping back and forth quite a bit as we bounce around to try and piece together what, what do we know and what don't we know. As always, you're welcome to have a paper and a pen or pencil along to be able to take some notes as we go. So as we're beginning our time together, it's always helpful to be able to keep our terms straight, uh, to make sure that we're on the same page and we're, that we're talking about the same thing. So in the course of this study, when I talk about uh, a near-death experience or an out-of-body experience, I'm talking about the same thing. Now, yes, they are different experiences. Sometimes a, a person sees themselves kind of floating outside their body, uh, maybe like while they're having surgery. Um, or while they're having, I have to just say, if they had a car accident or something, that you know they they're able to see their body uh, sitting there or laying there, or maybe somebody's had an experience of um, they they died and they saw heaven and, or they saw hell, um, or they're you know going down the going down the tunnel towards that bright light. Um, there's lots of different experiences out there. And so for this study, we're, we're kind of lumping them together um, and to say that, you know, it's something outside the normal, something where they're, they're out of their body, um, they're, some, some, you know, they're, they're experiencing something outside the normal, whether it's a near-death experience or an out-of-body experience. You know, it's basically where, you know, they were, they were dead or they're outside their body floating around. And we get this quite a few times. Um, this is gets seems about every I don't know five six years or so. It seems like there's another book that gets real popular, uh, talking about an out of body experience. Uh, there's been a few of them over the years that, um, like ninety minutes in heaven or heaven is for real is some of the uh, really big ones from a few years ago. And you know, and oftentimes the book is very popular, New York Times bestseller, and then. And because it's a bestseller and big money maker, then it oftentimes gets made into a movie. And some of these, some of these uh, books and some of these uh, movies and experiences are from a Christian perspective, um, and where they're talking about going to heaven and seeing Jesus, um, and you know, and the person comes back to life or comes back into their body, and then goes around and tells people about Jesus and shares the gospel with others. Sometimes these books are written from a mildly Christian or non-Christian perspective where there's nothing really about God or um, it's just all kind of very generic or very different. And so not all these books and movies are the same, uh, but they're all talking about some kind of an outside the body experience where they're, where they're seeing something different. Now for us as Christians, 
Uh, we're not going to get into some of the specifics of like heaven is for real or, or 90 minutes in heaven. Um, instead, we're going to kind of take a step back and we're just going to look at this in general. Uh, we're going to look at this uh, issue in general and say, all right, what Bible verses would I go to if all of a sudden I come across the movie Heaven is for Real? What Bible verses would I go to if somebody gave me a book that they recommend or I'm talking with somebody and they're sharing an experience? You know, what Bible verses would I go to to structure my thoughts? So that, that's going to be how we're going to shape our time. I hope this doesn't come as a surprise, but during Bible study, we're going to go to the Bible. So let's do that. Let's start with opening up to our first scripture passage. So let's open up our Bibles to Job chapter 7. Uh, Job, if you're looking in the Bible, that's in the Old Testament. It's a pretty long book, and you can find it then uh, right before Psalms. So especially if you kind of uh, open up your Bible to the middle, you get a pretty good chance of, ch chance of landing in the Psalms. Grab a pinch of pages and go before, and you'll end up here in Job. So at this point in time, uh, Job is being tested for his faith. Uh, he's being uh, uh, he's being tested. He's um, his life is falling apart, and is just everything is basically going from bad to worse in his life. And and his friends sat with him quietly for a while and just were good friends. And now his friends are opening their mouths and are talking, and they're not being as good of friends. And so at this point in time, Job is answering back his friend Eliphaz. And as he's, t as he's talking here, uh, he talks about uh, the grave or Sheol, um, which is, you know, we would say like dying or the place of the dead. Uh, in scripture, when you see the word Sheol, um, uh, that's a shorthand way of saying dead. Um, some English translations, uh, the Bible will have the word Sheol in here. Some will just say the grave. And the grave is really a good translation. Uh, this Hebrew word Sheol would be kind of like we would say, like six feet under. If we say somebody is six feet under, that means they died. Well, if you say somebody is six feet under, does that mean they're a Christian or not a Christian? Well, you can use a term for either person. It just means that they died. Um, they're in the grave. And so the same thing with the word Sheol. Sheol doesn't necessarily mean hell. Sometimes it's used as hell, uh, but oftentimes it's just meant as the grave. Like we would say six feet under, a person who's passed away. So let's dive in here to Job. as a, This is a part of his response back to his friend in the midst of all these terrible things going on. Uh, so verses 9 and 10. As a cloud vanishes and is gone, so he who goes down from the grave to the grave does not return. He will never come to his house again. His place will know him no more. So as we're talking here, right here, Job and in many other places throughout scripture, it's a very consistent pattern that once we die, we normally do not return to life or know what is going on. This is God's normal way of operating, is you only die once, um, and then you don't come back to life again. Um, you don't, there, there isn't a going back and forth in between life and death. Um, God's normal way of operating is we die once. Now, if you notice, I've got normally here in parentheses, because can God work outside the normal? Yes. Again, remember, pretty much any question that starts with, can God? The answer is yes, because, well, God can do whatever he wants. He's God. Um, but the God does have normal ways of operating, which includes dying once. But there are times when God does break this mold. Other uh, times, even in Jesus' ministry, where he raised Lazarus, uh, raised the widow's son at Nain, raised Jairus' daughter. You know, uh, some people came back to life after his death and resurrection in Jerusalem. That there are times when people were brought back to life. And so God does break the mold sometimes, but that's not the normal way that it operates. 
That's not the way that we should expect it to operate. So let's go on and read our next passage. So as we're here, then let's go up to Hebrews chapter 9. Now again, Hebrews sounds like it should be uh, here in the Old Testament, but it's actually way over into towards the end of the New Testament. So as we're flipping to Hebrews, this was written by a Christian there in the first century. Um, he doesn't sign his name to the letter, so we don't know exactly who wrote it. It was written to Hebrew Christians, uh, Christians that had a Jewish background, who grew up going to going to church and going to Sunday school and going to Bible study and like they 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 grew up with this. They went to youth group. They like they grew up with this, and so they're very familiar with the scriptures. And so then Hebrews is able to draw so many of these Old Testament connections then uh, to Jesus and show how Jesus is the fulfillment of all of it and talk about His plan for everything. So as we get here to the end of chapter 9, I hear he's talking about how Christ's sacrifice on the cross is it's bigger, it's better, it's more complete than all the sacrifices that have come before. In fact, the entire sacrificial system, everything God has set up, has all been pointing people straight to Jesus. So let's join and let's read the last two verses here of chapter 9. Just as man is destined to die once, and after that to face judgment. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away sin, the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So here, when we die, then, okay, so we're, we're, we're normally only supposed to die once, and then we immediately face judgment. And we either go to heaven or hell. And so like when we die, then we normally are either immediately with the Lord or immediately away from the Lord. And so it's an immediate thing. Um, it's up with the Lord or down away from the Lord. There is no third option. Now, scripture doesn't talk about how well, once we die, um, you'll face judgment eventually. But, you know, maybe you can kind of hang around and kind of see how stuff works for a little while or have a neat experience before you face judgment. Nope. Scripture never talks about that. Uh, instead, Scripture talks about how when we die, we face judgment. We're before the Lord. Uh, you know, are you a Christian? Yes. Then you're with the Lord. If you're not a Christian, nope. Then you're away from the Lord. It's really quite cut and dry. Uh, scripture never talks about a third option of kind of floating around a little bit or having a having a neat experience or kind of hovering over the uh, surgeon's table or the car accident for a while or whatever it may be. Scripture doesn't talk about that. It talks about how normally when we die once, then we're either with the Lord or not immediately. For our next passage, let's open up to Luke chapter 16. As we're going here to Luke chapter 16, this is in a section of Jesus' teachings in and around Perea. And here, if you've got a, a red letter setting on your app, um, or if you've got a, a paper Bible with a red letter printing in there, or what Jesus says is printed in red, then you'll probably notice there's a lot of red in this section. Um, because this is all Jesus talking here. It's a section of a whole bunch of his teachings as he's out and about. And so here in Luke 16, this is a pretty common passage that gets brought up in, in these conversations. And so here, Luke is especially uh, recording this parable Jesus told. And remember, a parable is an illustration. Uh, there, it's like if somebody told you a, a story just to be, help try and illustrate a point, to get a point across. That's what Jesus is doing. That's what parables are doing. He's telling stories to help get a point across. And so you look for the point or look for the moral of the story. And it's always nice with parables like this one, where Jesus at the end of the parable just flat out gives us the moral of the story. He explains it to us. And so, again, if you try and take a parable, if you try and turn it literal, it oftentimes gets really weird really fast. Do that with any parable. Do that with any illustration, and you quickly miss the point. 
But this one, Jesus gives us the point right at the end. And so also here, something to be able to help with is, again, a reminder is when you're in the Bible, um, and especially in the New, this is a New Testament phrase of calling, talking about Moses and the prophets. Moses and the prophets is a shorthanded way of saying the Bible. That was the Bible to them. Um, but they didn't call it the Bible yet. They called it Moses and the prophets, or especially we would call it the Old Testament. They, and again, they didn't call it the Old Testament at this point because the New Testament was still in the midst of being written. So they didn't have a New Testament yet. It was just the Testament, Moses and the prophets. So as they quote Moses and the prophets here, they're talking about the Bible. So let's dive into this uh, very interesting and very vivid um, parable that Jesus tells. And we'll go through, and, and we're not going to pull it apart piece by piece. We're just going to read the whole thing, because thankfully Jesus will give us the punchline at the end. And Jesus says, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The name Lazarus means God is my help. So it's a common name. He's not talking about his buddy Lazarus. He's, he's just using the illustration of a guy who, whose name means God is my help. So in other words, the rich man was not a believer, and this poor man, Lazarus, was a believer. He was a Christian. All right, so let's keep going. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. Kind of a common Jewish phrase for heaven. The rich man also died and was buried in hell where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he came, so he called to him, Father Abraham. Have pity on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, uh, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warm, warn them, so that they will not come to this place of torment. Abraham re replied, They have Moses and the prophets, that is the Bible. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, uh, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. So this is a great parable that Jesus tells about the power of God's word of how God's word works. And God's word is all that we need to be saved. Um, everything, all the good news, all, everything that we need to be saved is all right in God's word. And so as he's talking here, now if we tried to pull this out of context and turn this parable into a real life story, it would be super bizarre. Here's these, there's this conversation going on between a guy in hell and Abraham up in heaven. And, and he wants Lazarus to come and dip his finger in water and take a trip on down to hell and drip the water into his mouth. I mean, yeah, this is obviously a parable. And so as we read here, he says this amazing thing. He says, all right, you know, Abraham replies, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. And he says, no, 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 no. All right. But if somebody comes back from the dead, I know my brothers aren't believers. I know they don't believe. But if somebody comes back from the dead, then they'll believe. Then they will for sure believe. Then, 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 then they'll take this whole God thing seriously. And how does Abraham respond? If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, if they don't listen to the Bible, then someone coming back from the dead will not even convince them. What an what an a very insightful way to say, you know, that we place our trust 
and God's reliable and trustworthy word. At the end of the day, this is what we do, um, that we don't need the testimony of somebody coming back from the dead in order to know that it's true, in order to know that it's right. We can be able to go to God's word and we can trust God's word no matter what. So this is good. And so does, so does this immediately discredit any out-of-body experience? No. I would say, no, this doesn't immediately discredit any out-of-body experience. But what this does say is we don't go to that out-of-body experience to now know that things are true. We don't say, oh, heaven is for real uh, because this child had this experience and he, and he saw his family in heaven. And so now we know that the Bible is true. No, we already know that the Bible is true because it's God's word. Um, and then we start with God's word, and then we use that to evaluate other things. We don't use other books and say, oh, look, now we know the Bible is true. No, we start with God's word. We start with God's incredibly trustworthy and reliable word. We have Moses and the prophets. We have God's word. So let's turn next to Romans chapter 10. Uh, here in Romans uh, chapter 10. Paul's writing to the Christians in Rome. We've been reading from Romans a lot in worship um, because we're taking a good chunk of our summer to be able to read our way through uh, the highlights of this incredible book in worship. And there's so much in there. Uh, here in Romans chapter 10, this is some great stuff. Uh, here as he's talking about God's, how God's plan of salvation, his plan of saving is for everyone. That's for everybody. And he wants everybody to be saved and to be go out and to be sent to preach, to share his good news with others. And then we come to this incredible passage uh, here in verse 17. Here in verse 17, uh, we read, Now consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. And so, this is a common theme throughout Scripture, and here he's talking about how, you know, it's important for us to go. It's important for us to get out there and, and to share our faith with others, and to take a stand for Christ, um, and to stand on this incredible, reliable good news in God's Word, um, because we want others to be saved, and faith comes from hearing. That saving faith comes through the gospel, though, the Word of God, not someone's experience. Uh, we can look at the, we can look outside at a at a beautiful sunset or a beautiful sunrise, or enjoy some of the incredible weather that we've that we've had this summer, and just say, ah, oh, God is so good. There's, I mean, it's incredible evidence of God in our creation, and we can and we can experience God in His incredible creation, but what we can't experience is saving faith in creation. That we need the gospel. You can you look at the world around us and know that it's pretty obvious that there is a God out there. And pretty obvious that he's a pretty loving God. Um, but that doesn't get you all the way to saving faith. Um, it's a good start, but it doesn't get you all the way to... In order to have saving faith, we need the gospel. We need Jesus dying on the cross and winning forgiveness for our sins. That's the gospel. That's the core of the good news. And that's what, at the end of the day, saves us. Uh, and so experience of somebody having an, an out-of-body experience or a near-death experience, uh, you know, at the end of the day, that's not what produces saving faith. It may open up doors for saving faith. It may, it may silence some arguments or cause somebody to pause a little bit. But at the end of the day, Scripture is very clear that saving faith comes only through the gospel, through God's Word. And so at the end of the day, we still keep going back to God's Word. We don't need somebody's incredible experience to know that God's Word is true. We've already got his good news. And this is the good news we want to share with somebody. We could say, oh, here's this great movie about an out-of-body experience that we could share with an unbeliever. And maybe they'd be willing to watch it. And, you know, seeing somebody else have an incredible experience, it'll maybe open up doors. It'll maybe soften their heart or make them willing to have a conversation. But at the end of the day, we still need to have that conversation with somebody because faith comes through the gospel through God's word, not outside the normal experiences.
So let's turn back to John chapter 20. Uh, I know we were right there in Luke and we bounced back here uh, to Romans, but we're, we're, we're bouncing back and forth here. So let's go back to John. Um, and so here, and you go from Romans, we're going to go through Acts, and then we're here into John. So at this point in John, then this is after Jesus has died. Uh, he's risen from the dead, and he's, Jesus is alive and well again. But now this is what Jesus says after Thomas says that he needs proof. Uh, Thomas, one of the disciples, said that he needed he needs some proof. Um, he, he needs a, an, an experience in order to know that Jesus is actually alive, that the resurrection is actually true. And, and Jesus gives him the proof. He says, all right, go ahead. Touch my hand. Touch my side. Go ahead. All the proof standing literally right in front of you. But then Jesus says this incredible thing here in verse 29. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is an incredible and oftentimes quoted passage. You know, Jesus himself encourages us to take him at his word, that we don't need proof. Uh, that proof is not the, the thing that's going to make everything all better. No, he says, we take him at his word. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so that's what faith is, is trusting even if we haven't seen. I trust that my car is going to start, um, even though I haven't gone out there and, and turned the key on it yet. But I trust that it will start. Um, you know, trusting is by definition something that we can't see, um, is believing. And so... And we can trust, we can believe in him because he is trustworthy. You can trust your car is going to start because maybe it's never let you down before or it's got a brand new battery. So, you know, you know that it's trustworthy and reliable. Same thing with Jesus. He is trustworthy and reliable. He's never once let us down and he never will let us down. He promises us this. So we can take him at his word and we don't need proof in order to know that he's true. We've got all the proof we need right there in Jesus. So next, let's open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So yes, now we're turning and we're going back the other way in our pages once again, as we're bouncing back and forth. Uh, but as we go here to the second letter that Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth, uh, one of the things he's doing now is uh, Paul's also in Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth is, has a much more, much more comforting, much more encouraging tone. His first letter to the Christians in Corinth was pretty direct, pretty blunt, because it was a mess. Uh, the church and the Christians there and their lives, it was just, it was just a mess. So the first letter is pretty direct, kind of trying to get them to straighten up. Then things straightened up and things actually got on the right track and they're moving forward. And so his second letter is much more encouraging, saying, hey, good job, guys. Way to be and writing about, a, and even kind of defending himself against people who were trying to discredit Paul's authority. So here in the second Corinthians chapter 12, Paul's especially uh, boasting, and uh, you can say kind of talking it up, how God is faithful, and especially even in the midst of suffering. So this is an interesting experience where Paul appears to have had an out-of-body experience. Paul appears to have had this type of experience that like we're talking about today. So let's go through and let's, since, since there's a lot in here, we're going to go through and we're going to read all of verses 1 through 10 all together to get the context. Uh, then we're going to go back and kind of read it in chunks. So let's do all of it starting at verse 1. Paul writes, I must go on boasting Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. 
He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so that no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. To keep me from being becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So there's a lot going on here. But here Paul's talking about some kind of a some kind of a out of body type experience that he had 14 years before writing this. And so Paul he's kind of writing. He's saying, "All right, well, uh, I I I know about a guy." Well, he's talking about himself. Um, we believe that he's talking about himself because that's why he was given this thorn in the flesh. So let's go back and let's read this in um, chunks and kind of walk our way through this a little bit more to be able to process this out-of-body experience that Paul had. So let's do especially verses 1 through 6. I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. This is a, uh, um, uh, Paul's here talking about himself, but he's talking about himself kind of in third person saying, oh yeah, I, uh, I, I know a guy, I know a guy. Well, he's talking about him, he's the guy. And he's caught up to the third heaven. Uh, the third heaven was a common Jewish phrase for heaven. Um, that, you know, the word heavens in Hebrew is, is Hebrew, or it, in Hebrew it's plural. And so oftentimes we'd be talking about, and so like the caught up to the third heaven was kind of like um, a Jewish phrase at this time saying, oh, it was the best of the best experience. It was so great. You know, um, sometimes we, um, in our culture, we talk about like seventh heaven, um, kind of a common way of saying, oh, just as good as it gets, the best of the best of the best. And so let's keep going here in verse 3, um, or keep going here in the middle of verse 2. So whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. But God knows, was caught up to paradise. So he's saying, all right, so uh, Paul had this some kind of like an, an incredible experience. And you can call it an out-of-body experience, maybe call it a a vision of heaven, call it what you will, but he had this incredible out-of-body type experience. And he's not trying to explain it or put a label on it. He's just saying that he had this amazing experience. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even though I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so that no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. So Paul's saying, all right, I had this incredible out-of-body experience, but I'm not going to get into that. He's saying, I could talk about it. I could talk about this amazing experience I had and just these incredible things I heard. He says, but nah, I don't want any, I don't want any attention drawn to me. I don't, I don't want to make a living off of this. I don't want to make a name for myself because of this experience God gave me. And so Paul is saying, all right, he had this out-of-body experience, but he doesn't want to draw any attention to it. He doesn't want to kind of make any money or make a big deal off of it. He's, he would rather, he wants to stay humble and say, no, there's nothing special about me that I have this experience. I just did. In fact, it goes on as he's talking here in verse 7, explains the thorn that he had. So Paul had some kind of an out-of-body experience. He had some kind of an incredible experience, 
But let's go on and let's read especially verses 7 and 8 to be able to see how he processes it, how he understands this incredible experience. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. And so Paul was not supposed to focus too much on this experience. He's saying, all right, so to keep me from getting uh, fixated on this out-of-body experience, to keep me from kind of making it into too big of a deal, he was given this thorn in his flesh, something that he struggled with. Now, we don't know what the thorn in the flesh was. There's lots of guesses out there. Um, some guesses, guesses say it was maybe some kind of like a speech impairment. Um, some say that it was maybe uh, poor eyesight. Maybe it was some kind of like a, a physical defect um, that, you know, maybe it was some uh, sickness or injury that he suffered. Uh, we don't know what his thorn in the flesh is. Again, he doesn't get into the details. He just says the point was to not focus on this out-of-body experience. And in fact, he does tell us here what we are to focus on. So let's go ahead and let's read especially uh, verses 9 and 10 to finish off this section. But he, that is God, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insult, in hardships, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So here God makes it very clear that the focus is on God's grace not on some incredible experience. And Paul did have some incredible experience, but that's not the point. The point is God's grace. The point is how God is with us through our hard times. Whether or not we have an out-of-body experience, whether or not we even know somebody, the point is God's love and his grace. So let's open up to our final Bible passage. This will be the last uh, passage in Scripture we'll take a look at for today. Is 1 John chapter 4. So this is not the Gospel of John, where we were just a little bit ago. Um, we're now going to 1 John, so even further back, way towards the end of the New Testament. Uh, if you hit Revelation, you've gone too far, kind of grab a little pinch of pages and go back. As we get to 1 John. So the Apostle John wrote his Gospel. Uh, and then he also wrote uh, three other letters that were circulated around and kind of like forwarded between the different churches. And he also wrote Revelation after this. And so as he's writing here in 1 John, he's uh, picking up and he's talking a lot about how there's a, a lot of false teachers. Uh, there's a lot of people who are coming up and are just saying nonsense. Now they're saying all these terrible things and they're trying to lead people astray. And, uh, and so sometimes the Christians are having a hard time telling, all right, how do we know if they're telling the truth? Because again, back then, they didn't exactly have like, you know, their ID card. You know, they couldn't just kind of pull out their wallet and say, all right, here's, here's my official card to show that I'm an authorized apostle. They didn't have that back then. Somebody would just, you know, they would show up and they would start sharing. And sometimes Christians would have a hard time telling, all right, is this guy legitimate or not? Like, is he telling us the truth or is he just kind of making up some nonsense? And so John writes to them and he explains how to tell if somebody's telling the truth or not. How to, how to analyze, how to critique something and how to, what a good rule of thumb is. So let's go through and let's, uh, we'll read, uh, let's read all of verses 1 through 6 all together. Where John writes, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and, coming and is now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, 
because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world, and they speak from the point of view of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever does not, is not from God, does not listen to us. This is how we can recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. So this is great. And here we have a fantastic rule of thumb. So if we kind of hear about an out-of-body experience, whether we had it or we hear somebody talking about it, or it's in a movie or a TV show or a book, even if it's written by a Christian, how do we know if it's real or not? How do we know if it's legitimate or not? This great rule of thumb is if the experience lines up with God's word, then we can trust it. You know, every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus is the Christ, yes, that's true. If it, if it agrees with God's word, then we can trust it. And the flip side is also true. If the experience does not line up with God's word, then we cannot trust it. So if someone claims to have an out-of-body experience and, um, and their experience completely contradicts God's word, uh, all right, well, we've already got God's reliable word, so yeah, and I'm not so sure about that experience. Maybe they were just hallucinating. Maybe they're just making it up. I don't know. Um, but if their experience lines up with God's word, then I have no reason to doubt it. Because God can and does work outside the normal. Uh, his normal way of operating is for us to for us to die, to immediately face judgment, and then we're we're separated from the world. We don't come back and forth between living and dead. That's his normal way of working. But God can and does break that mold sometimes, as Jesus even did in his own ministry. And so sometimes God does break that mold. So a good rule of thumb is, all right, does their experience line up with God's word? Then we can trust it. If this, this, did this person have an out-of-body experience and they were in heaven? And their description of heaven lines up with scripture? Well, then, then I don't have a reason to doubt it. And yeah, it could very well be a legitimate experience. We can trust it. But if they, but if they claim to go to heaven and they're spending how long walking around in heaven and doing all these things, but God never shows up? Uh, yeah, then I would be very suspect of that because... God is in heaven. Um, you know, it's not its not like this person showed up in heaven and was walking around and, oh, God was too busy to greet him at the front door. No, the definition of heaven is being in God's presence. That's what scripture says. So if someone would claim to be in heaven and be walking around and doing all these things, but, you know, if there's no talk of God or Jesus, uh, I would be very suspect of that. Because, again, it doesn't line up with God's word. So let, So, again... We always hold the Bible in one hand um, as, we're, as we're understanding things and see how it lines up with what God already tells us. That's a good rule of thumb to see, is it trustworthy or not? Because there are some trustworthy accounts out there, and there are some not-so-trustworthy accounts out there. So again, let's bring it all together um, as we answer the question, all right, so why does it matter? Because most of us have not had an out-of-body experience. And in fact, most of us never will have an out-of-body experience. That's outside the norm. That's not God's normal way of operating. And so since most of us will never experience this, why does it matter? Well, it matters because if someone has an experience that lines up with God's word, then we can trust them. Again, all these experiences, all this keeps driving us right back into God's word, keeps driving us right back into the, the foundation of our faith and the incredible good news that we can trust in. And so, you know, we can watch those TV shows. We can watch those movies. We can read those books. We can have those conversations with people who have out-of-body experiences. But while we do that, we also have our Bible sitting in our lap. We have our Bible open to be able to say, all right, so does this experience line up with God's word or not? Can I trust this experience or not? Also, we have God's trustworthy word, so we don't need to rely on other experiences. God is very clear. We don't need an out-of-body experience. Someone doesn't need an out-of-body experience in order for them to have faith. 
Faith comes only through hearing the word of Christ, the gospel, the good news of how he loves us and how he went to the cross for us. And so if we never have one of these experiences, and most of us never will, that's okay. We don't need one of these experiences. We've got Jesus, and we've got his incredible word to guide us in our lives. And so these are some these are some tools. Again, we didn't in this Bible study, we haven't gotten it, we didn't get into like specifics of different books. If you've got a different book or a movie or a TV show or some out of body experience uh, that you'd like to get into the specifics of, let me know and we can dive into it together. Um, you know, but most of the time it's much more general. And so the, the focus of this study again was to be able to give you the tools that you need to be able to help evaluate these books and movies and TV shows and conversations that we have so that you can know, all right, should I put any stock in this or not? You know, should I really, should I recommend this book or this movie to somebody else or should I not? Um, and to be able to kind of have a framework to be able to understand these things with. Again, as always, if you've got any other questions that you would like for us to be able to dive into, please let me know. Um, this is our Bible study time. This is our time to be able to dive into God's word. And so if you've got questions from this Bible study that don't make sense or clarifications, uh, catch me on Sunday morning uh, uh, with our outdoor service, with our drive through communion or fellowship time, or give me a call, send me an email. Uh, just kind of let me know if there's any questions or things that don't make sense. And if you've got different studies that you'd like for us to dive into, let me know. We can dive into God's word on, on anything that we want during this time together. So as we oftentimes love to be able to end our Bible studies, uh, let's close it out with praying the Lord's Prayer and singing the doxology. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, God's blessings be with you, and I hope you have a good day.